The city of Surat today is known as one of the cleanest in India, but it wasn't always like this. In 1994, the Indian city suffered a plague of truly catastrophic proportions. Within a week, the city was declared an international epidemic site and quarantined by both local officials and the Indian army. The scale of this plague was such that it demanded national attention and a reassessment of how the basic foundation of city administration worked in the aftermath. When over 400,000 people are able to leave the city and medicine able to treat the infestation is out of stock and hoarded, you have a problem. How do you come back from an event like this? When we often speak of city planning and public administration in the developed world, at large, we often speak of institutions which have been around for centuries, running autonomously from a central state. Governmental bodies with a degree of standards in areas of sanitation, education, transportation, with a budget to back them up. For developing nations whose budgets can often come from a variety of non-tax revenue sources, there are often a perpetuated lack of funds which compound and cripple local development, even if those facilities need upgrades. The standards are likely there on paper, but structural problems plague meeting those standards for a majority of the population. India is a lot more centralized than one might think. Civil servants from the Indian Administrative Services fulfill duties on behalf of the central or state governments. Their duties can range depending on the needs of the administration requesting them. All cities in India above 1 million in population have both an elected mayor and a municipal commissioner who oversees the daily administrative functions. If you want me to talk more in depth about how the Indian government is organized, let me know in the comments down below. For our purposes today, the most important thing we need to focus on are the difference in responsibilities that Indian municipal corporations have, which differ drastically from Western governments. In the United States, for instance, inspection of slaughterhouses and tanneries would likely fall under some federal equivalent in the Department of Agriculture. However, Indian municipal governments, as we can see, must do that work on their own. It is this kind of difference in responsibility that commissioners of municipal corporations take on when they are appointed. After the plague had been contained and the Gujarat state government recognized that the planning and operation of a city needed re-evaluation, a civil servant named S. R. Rao was selected to lead Surat. He would later describe the posting as a suicide mission. While I don't want to put this man on a pedestal, he is a shining example of what makes an excellent public servant, especially given what that city had just experienced. The foundation of Surat's government wasn't rotten as much as it didn't exist in the eyes of the average citizen. Local wealthy residents had flaunted all kinds of regulations, whether designing buildings, parking, you name it, they were like local princes. S. R. Rao, in this kind of environment, went out personally, along with his staff, every morning to ensure that people knew there was a government that existed to support not only the city's development, but its population. Rao's strategy, so-called ACDC governance, got the office workers into the streets and out of their air-conditioned rooms to establish confidence and an understanding of the impact of their work. They would ensure regulations were followed and that no outbreak would occur under the watch of the new commissioner. If this would mean going against those wealthy few who thought of Sarad Moore as a giant playground, then let that be the case. Given the wealth imbalance in India, it was not uncommon for legislators to hire security details, but Rao was determined to get the city on a better footing. Taxes in India are a very tricky thing. One of the largest issues India has is that there are millions working in a so-called informal gray economy, where taxes are either underreported or not paid. Often, this includes people like farmers, low-level shopkeepers, etc. While today there are millions, the gray market was estimated to be a lot higher in the 1990s when India lacked the digital infrastructure it has today to track these sorts of things. S. R. Rao targeted the tax dodgers who owed the government massive sums which could be collected on, and ended up giving Surat a war chest to use towards larger improvements. The fact that many of these people were wealthy local and state figures 
was merely coincidence, of course. According to Outlook magazine, in 1996, the gutters have been cleaned and covered. Roads and streets have been broadened and paved all over. In the residential areas, the shopping centers, and even the red light street close to the Surat municipal office itself. If nature had burdened Surat with black dust and profusion, Rao has given the city its streets, free of junk and garbage, its slums, pay and use solab toilets, and a cleaner environment. Rao's work turned a municipal corporation that citizens didn't even know existed to operate in their behalf into a true political body. Organs of state functioning at the municipal level to ensure the city would prosper and not linger in decay after a plague. Complaint forms, a seemingly simple but powerful tool, were put in place for remanding bad conduct from officials, who would then be held accountable for their actions. In a nation such as India, which has suffered from endemic corruption and a lack of institutional accountability, these tools for holding officials accountable to the public, and more importantly their enforcement, were one pillar among many that S.R. Rao set up for the betterment of the city. Although he only served for a few short years in Surat before moving on to other posts within the Indian administrative system, those few years were a strong indication of character and the good that public servants can do. The simplest of changes can sometimes lead to radically positive outcomes. One year after finalizing his time in Surat, S.R. Rao was awarded India's fourth highest civil honor called Vipadma Shri. After his time in Surat had finished, the former municipal commissioner became the head of India's third largest state-owned port located in Andhra Pradesh. He also went on to work with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, as well as working with the Communications and Information Technology Ministry. Wherever you are in the world, I encourage you to look for the political figures in your region who are fighting for change, no matter how small. Whether those changes mean fixing sewage lines, cleaning up pollution in the land or water, fighting for cultural preservation, electrifying a remote area, or solving larger national crises, public servants spend their hours trying to create solutions for issues far larger than themselves. I wanted to tell this man's story for a very simple reason. As an example, that bureaucrats and public servants are not some nebulous blob like these people. They do real work that impacts people's lives on the day to day. In India, they go through rigorous examinations in order to be selected. That selection process for the Indian administrative services could very easily be a video in and of itself. If they are selected from a batch of hopeful candidates, the job can be a life-changing career. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you. Please leave a comment, like the video, and share it if you found it informative. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.